Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Coulter. And starring tonight, two of radio's foremost actors, Ralph Bell and Charlotte Holland, in Killer at Large. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as we drop in on a very clever gentleman. A gentleman who perfected an ingenious plan to be rid of people he disliked without ever having to suffer for it. I call his story, Killer at Large. <laughs> My friend, Mr. Jeffrey Andrews, is temporarily confined to a hospital. So we're going there to meet him. He's just been given a routine checkup by a new staff physician, Dr. French. Well, Dr. French, how am I? You seem to be in fine physical shape, Mr. Andrews. <laughs> Guess you'll have to be letting me go soon, eh? Well, I certainly hope so. Well, I've had a good rest, but I look forward to getting back in the harness again. I'm Andrews First, you know. Andrews First? That's the name of my business. You see, my name is Andrews. Yes? So I named my firm Andrews First. And all my advertising carried the line. When you think of building materials, think of Andrews First. Oh, yes. Very clever. <laughs> Used to drive my competitors crazy with my advertising. Yes, I pulled off many a smart deal. And I always let the world in on it. After all, what's the use of doing something smart if no one knows about it? Well, the urge to boast is certainly human. For instance, you probably don't know why I'm here. Haven't had a chance to study my case yet, I suppose. No, no, not in detail. Oh, then sit down. I'll tell you. It's really one of the cleverest deals I've ever swung. Now, tell me, have you ever wanted to get rid of someone? Get rid of someone? You mean, uh, kill them? Exactly. Kill them. <laughs> no, no, I don't believe I have. Why? Because most people have at one time or another. But they don't do it. They're afraid, afraid of the law and of being punished. Well, that's what the law is for, to restrain people's violent impulses. Exactly. Unless you happen to be smarter than the law, as I was. Because, you see, I figured out how to get rid of not just one person, but of two. Two people I disposed of and can't ever be punished for it. That's an unusual achievement. You disprove? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you how I did it. As I said, what's the use of being clever if people don't know about it? And since the law can't touch me, why not? To make it clear, Doctor, I'll go back to the very beginning. To that evening when I arrived home from work to find my wife, Judith, and my best friend and personal physician at that time, Alex Hearn, deep in conversation. They jumped apart guiltily as I entered the room and closed the door. Oh, Jeff, it's you. Yes, I uh, left the office early. Hello, Alex. How are you? Fine, Jeff. And you? Oh, a little tired. I've been working late quite a bit recently. Yes, so Judith is saying. So what's this about you buying a share in a new invention that's going to make you richer than Rockefeller? <laughs> I've picked up a half interest in a new system of television, Alex. Three dimensional television in color. Mm. Sounds big. Big. It's Colossal Man. It's still in the blueprint stage, but we'll iron the bugs out soon. But uh, what were you two plotting so busily when I came in? Plotting? Well, dear, we were just talking. Nothing serious. I was giving Judith a little professional advice, that's all. Oh, don't you feel well, darling? It, it's nothing, Jeff, nothing at all. Oh, whatever it is, I want to know about it. Well, it, it's just that I've been having headaches lately, that's all. But why didn't you tell me, Judith? I didn't want to worry you over nothing, Jeff. It's really nothing serious. I've given Judith the prescription that will help her. Well, I think I'd better run along now. Got another call to make. You take care of yourselves now, both of you. As Alex left, I knew from his manner he and Judith had not told me the truth. They were keeping some secret from me. Could Judith be seriously ill and they didn't want me to know? Or was it possible Judith and Alex were... 
were... No, no, that couldn't be. A thing like that might happen to other couples, but not to Judith and me. And yet, they were concealing something, and I had to know what. So I took steps to find out. Uh, Mr. Andrews, I'm from the Apex Detective Agency. I have here the report on your wife uh, he asked for. Uh, yes, please sit down. Uh, thank you. Uh, what have you uh, learned? Your wife left the house at 11.30 this morning. She caught the noon train into town. From the station, she went uh, directly to the Union Department store. Whom did she meet there? Oh, she didn't meet anyone, Mr. Andrews. She just looked around, then uh, had lunch in the restaurant. But uh, afterwards... Yes, go on. Uh, she made a telephone call. A few minutes later, she's picked up at the entrance by a man in a dark green car. You got the license number, I hope. Yes, sir. The car belongs to Alexander Hearn, who lives... Never mind. Home. I know his address. Uh, we, we need to handle hundreds of such cases, Mr. Andrews. I suppose you'll want me to keep following it until I get all the necessary evidence. No. I know what you're thinking. It's not so. Yeah. And naturally, I sympathize, Mr. Andrews. Of course, it's a shock to learn your wife is deceiving you and... Why, you... You're joking me. It isn't so. Do you hear? My wife loves me. There's nothing between them. <laughs> nothing! <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean anything. I just thought you'd want me to... Get out of here. There's nothing between them. How easily I'd said that. And yet, why should Judith meet Alex secretly in town? Where had they gone after they had eluded the detective? I wanted to trust her, but what was their secret? I had to find out. And that night, when I returned home, I casually questioned Judith. Uh, what did you do with yourself today, darling? Oh, I... I got so bored, I went into town for some inexpensive window shopping. Oh, why didn't you phone me? I'd have taken you to lunch. Well, I knew how busy you were, dear, so I ate by myself. What did you do after lunch? Taking a show? No, just window shopped. Then came home on the four o'clock train. <laughs> Sounds like a lonely day. You uh, should have taken someone with you. Well, I didn't decide to go until the last moment. Anyway, I like to window shop alone. Jeff, you look so strange. Aren't you feeling well? Uh, I'm all right. Just a little tired. Oh, poor darling. You're working much too hard these days. You must stop it, Jeff. Really, you must. <laughs> I settled down, pretending to read, but my mind was spinning tormentedly. I didn't decide to go until the last moment. Anyway, I liked to window shop alone. How easily her answers had come, as though she'd rehearsed them. But they were lies, all of them. Could the detective have been right and I wrong? No, I couldn't believe that. I had no proof. I had to have faith in Judith. I... I made myself believe I was doing her an injustice. But the very next evening, I found Alex at the house again. He and Judith were walking in the garden, speaking together in low tones, so secretly they didn't even notice me. Now, Judith, you, you must listen to no, me. No, Alex, I won't. If I tell you we can't go on like this. But if we're careful, Jeff may never find out. But he's bound to. People will begin to notice and talk. Sooner or later, Jeff will know that something's wrong. And the longer we wait, the worse it'll be in the end. I know. Oh, Alex, I can't bear to hurt him. Oh, Judith, I understand how you feel, but it can't be helped. Now, I have a plan worked out that can't fail. A plan, Alex? Two psychiatrists who are friends of mine will sign the papers, and Jeff will be quietly committed to a private sanitarium. We'll make him think it's just uh, for a short rest. He'll never suspect a thing. Oh, Alex, I couldn't. But we can't go on hiding the truth from him like this. Believe me, Judith, it's the only way out. All right, I'll do whatever you say. But we mustn't let Jeff suspect what's happening. And I had faith in her. I thought I was misjudging her when all along she and Alex had been scheming to railroad me into a sanitarium. Oh, it was a clever plan. Alex could manage it through his professional connections, and Judith would become administrator of my fortune. I almost let them know I'd overheard them. 
and then I got control of myself. There was a better way to handle the situation. I had to think about it and decide what to do. So I slipped quietly away. And a little later, I took Judith out for a drive as though I suspected nothing. But as I drove, I pondered how best to punish them. What are you thinking about, Jeff? You've hardly said a word all evening. Jeff, I'm speaking to you. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, dear. I'm afraid my mind was on business. You really are working too hard these days. Oh, I'm not working that hard. Too bad we couldn't persuade Alex to come with us tonight. He's always such fun when he forgets he's a doctor. <laughs> That's because he puts his work completely out of his mind when he gets a chance to relax. I suppose it would be better if I were like Alex. Of course not, dear. I like you just as you are, Jeff. Silent moods and all. I wouldn't want you changed. She lied. I knew she was lying. By now, I found it impossible to believe a word she said. I had too much evidence to the contrary. Of course, Mr. Andrews, it's a shock to learn your wife is too time in here. But if we're careful, Jeff may never find out. I have a plan worked out that can't fail. Two psychiatrists who are friends of mine will sign the papers, and Jeff will be quietly committed to a private sanitarium. I like you just as you are, Jeff. Silent moods and all. I wouldn't want you changed. How easily she said that. How smoothly she continued her deception. Bitter rage burned inside me and deliberately I stepped hard on the throttle. We went faster and faster until Judith became frightened. Jeff, why are you going so fast? We're doing more than 60 and there are a lot of curves in the road. Oh, don't worry, Judith. I'm a good driver. Yes, but darling... We're almost up to 70. Now, Jeff, please, please slow down. We'll be killed. Too bad Alex isn't with us. He'd enjoy this. Now, Jeff, please, darling, slow down. There's a crossroads ahead, then a curve. Jeff, you'll kill us both. I kept my foot hard on the throttle. I knew there was a curve ahead, and behind it, a 300-foot drop into a canyon. I made up my mind. I'd drive over the cliff and end everything for both of us. If only I'd had Alex in the car, everything would be perfect. He deserved to die, too. At the thought, my mind cleared abruptly. How stupid it would be to kill myself and leave Alex unpunished when I knew perfectly just how to make him pay. I slowed the car as I planned all my moves. They were going to try to commit me to a home, were they? All right. I'd fall in with their plot. I'd actually help them by pretending to be unbalanced. I'd make it easy for them, and in a few days... A week, perhaps. We'd see who was the cleverer. We'd see. Alex, I tell you, there's millions in this new system of television. Maybe billions. Darling, you're speaking so loudly. Everyone in the restaurant is watching. Well, let them. What does it matter? Nothing can stop me now, man. In five years, I'll be one of the wealthiest men in the world. With my genius for organization... Uh, Jeff, Judith tells me that last week you didn't go to your office at all. You just sat around the house and wouldn't say a word to anyone. Oh, well, you know how it is, Alex. Sometimes a man feels a little blue. All geniuses are like that. Now, when I set up my new television network, I'll revolutionize world communication. I'll have a monopoly no one will be able to buck. And furthermore... <laughs> I went on talking, seeing Alex's eyes narrow as he watched me. He saw in me all the symptoms of the manic depressive, the exaggerated ideas of importance, the extravagant dreams of wealth. Soon others would notice, my business associates, my friends, the servants. When that time came, I could count on a visit from Alex, bringing his psychiatrist friends to look me over. Yes, that visit would be coming very soon now very soon. Jeff, darling. Alex has come to see you. He has two friends with him. Hello, Jeff, old man. How are you? Oh, just fine, Alex. For the last month, I've been working on the plans for my television network. It's going to be the biggest thing of the century. Jeff, I want to talk to you. And I want you to meet some men I brought with me. Oh, Alex, I've no time to talk with strangers. There are two doctors. 
close friends of mine. Well, what do they want? With my plans taking up all my time, I... They're here because of your new project, Jeff. You see, Judith has been afraid you're working too hard these days. I'm probably just being silly, darling. But I would like you to have a thorough examination before really starting on your new enterprise. You don't mind, do you? Oh, I haven't time to bother with such things. You know, I have too much to do. Please, Jeff. Oh, well. <laughs> All right, but it mustn't take too long now. So they're waiting in the hall. I'll bring them right in. At last, my patience was being rewarded. Alex and Judith's scheme was working perfectly. And so was mine. Alex brought in his friends and introduced them as Doctors Carlton and Marshall. Without waiting for them to question me, I plunged into an excited description of my plans. As I went on and on, I saw them look at each other and nod slightly. Then, as though they were satisfied, Dr. Marshall brought the conversation to a close. That'll be enough for the time being, Mr. Andrews. I should like to continue this discussion another time. But, Doctor, I haven't finished telling you of my plans yet. Uh, you need some rest, Jeff. Yes, dear, you look so tired. Let me take you to your room. <laughs> well, all right, Judith, but I can't rest long. <laughs> I have too much work to do. Alex, watch him carefully. There should soon be a definite change. The elated mood should give way to despondency. After that... I couldn't help overhearing Dr. Marshall's words as Judith led me out of the room. Alex, watch him carefully. There should soon be a definite change. And he was correct. I knew the right symptoms just as well as he did. So the next day I became depressed. Refused to speak, claimed that I was being persecuted, and even pretended to cry in self-pity. And the following morning, Alex and his two friends were back again. Good morning, Mr. Andrews. Uh, you remember Dr. Marshall, Jeff? And Dr. Carlton? Jeff, say hello to your guest. No. Leave me alone. I don't want to talk to anyone. Uh -huh. The other day, you were highly infused about your new business venture. Don't you want to tell me more about it? No. No one cares about my plans. I'm alone, all alone. Everyone's against me. Yes. Uh, do you feel this way often? I mean that everyone's against you and life isn't worth living? Yes. How did you know? Well, that's because I'm your friend. You can tell me all about it. You don't know what it's like to be all alone, to have no friends, to know that everyone hates you, wants to hurt you. Yes, I understand. Well, I'll see that no one hurts you. Wouldn't you like to go someplace where you'd be safe? Where you'd be surrounded by people who were your friends and wanted to help you? Yes, yes, I'd like that, but there isn't any such place. I think I know one. But we've talked long enough for now. Shall I have Judith take him in the garden? Yes, yes, I, I think it will do him good. Uh, uh, Judith, perhaps a little fresh air would make Jeff feel better. Why don't you take him for a walk in the garden? Yes, of course. Come, give me your hand, darling, and we'll go out in the sunshine for a while. That's it. I'll call you when we're ready. Yes, all right, Alex. I let Judith lead me into the gardens. Through the library windows, I could see Alex and the two psychiatrists. Alex wasted no time getting them to sign the papers that would commit me to a home from which he and Judith would see I never emerged. But he didn't know that the signing of those papers meant my scheme had succeeded, not his. After a few minutes, Alex came to the door and called. Judith, will you bring Jeff in now? Yes, all right. Come along, dear. All right, I'll come. Oh, Jeff, we've been talking things over, and um, Dr. Marshall knows a place where you'd be very happy. Yes, Mr. Andrews. Small rest home upstate. You'll be able to get a good rest there among friends. Anything, I don't care. No reason you shouldn't go up today. Alex can drive you up this afternoon. I don't care when we go. Nothing makes any difference to me. And, darling, in a little while, you'll be home again. Feeling so much better. Come, Jeff. Judith and I will help you pack. Yes, give me your hand now, Jeff. And we'll go with Alex to your room and pack your things. And we'll go with Alex to your room to pack your things. My best friend and my loving wife. And they couldn't wait to get rid of me. But I was smiling to myself in triumph as Judith opened the door to my room. Come in, dear. 
Now, you just sit down and we'll take care of everything. Oh, no, I must have courage, you. It's almost over. I, I think two bags will be enough for now. If Jeff needs anything later, you can take it to him. Yes, Alex. Jeff, dear, what suits would you like? Jeff, what are you looking in that golf bag for? Just something I've been keeping here. I've got it now. Jeff, a revolver? Yes. And fully loaded. Well, what do you want the gun for, Jeff? Here, give it to me. I'll take care of it for Stay you. Stay where you are. That's better. I want to talk to you. I've been waiting quite a while for this moment. What are you saying? Oh, come, come, Judith. You don't have to pretend anymore. Jeff, let me have that gun. I want you to stand still or I'll shoot. Alex, he means it. Yes, I do mean it. Your little plot's been an extremely clever one. Oh, a little plot? What do you mean? The idea of having me committed so you two could be rid of me. But you must admit I did help it along by my cooperation. Jeff, what are you talking about? It's no use pretending anymore, my dear. I've known everything for weeks. Ever since I overheard the two of you talking in the garden one evening. You heard us talking in the garden? Then that was why you almost killed yourself and me that night when you were driving so fast. Yes. I changed my mind because that would have left dear Alex still alive. Jeff, you don't understand that conversation you overheard. My wasn't... best friend and my loving wife. Well, you'll be together without me, all right. But we'll be in different worlds. You're mad, really mad. Of course I am, my dear, of course. Haven't two reputable doctors signed papers testifying to the fact? Which, in the eyes of the law, relieves me of responsibility for my actions. You aren't going to... But I am. Oh, no, Jeff. Yes, my dear, <laughs> yes. I'm going to give you both what you deserve, death. Oh, no, no, Jeff, no, you're, you're wrong, darling. You must There's listen to There's nothing to listen. But I shall be as considerate as possible, my dear. I shall punish Alex first. No, Jeff. We have been keeping a secret from you, but it's not the secret you think. You're wrong about the whole affair. I don't think so, Alex. Jeff, put that gun down. Jeff! <laughs> Jeff! But... Jeff, you... You should have listened... You've killed him. Yes, Judy. And now it's your turn. I shall be lonely without you. I loved you so much. Jeff, Jeff, darling, you mustn't kill me because you're wrong. I, I still love you, I do. I wish I could believe that, but I can't. Jeff, you've misinterpreted what you heard. Really, you have. I think not, now, Judy. Now, Jeff, please, please give me time enough to explain everything. Forever would you. not be time enough, my dear, and I would rather not think of you dying with lies upon your lips. But they're not lies. No, Jeff, no, no, put down that gun. Dr. Marshall, help, help! No one can help you. You see, the door is locked. It'll all be over long before anyone can get here. Now look into my eyes, Judy. Dr. Marshall, Dr. Colton! What is it, Mrs. Andrews? Break the door down, quickly! They can't get into this room in time, my dear. Now look into my eyes. It's because I loved you so much that I had to do this. Now, goodbye, Judith. So, Doctor, that's how I did it. I pulled the trigger just as Dr. Marshall and Dr. Carton broke the door down. Too late to save Judith. And you see the beauty of my plan, of course. It was perfectly safe. I was certified as being of unsound mind, so I couldn't be punished. Oh, naturally, for the last two years, I've been confined here in this institution, but I haven't minded it, really. I've been gradually responding to treatment. I've been uh, careful not to respond too fast, you see. And soon, you'll be letting me go as cured. I'll be free as air. Now, I ask you, Doctor... Wasn't that rather clever? It might be considered so, Mr. Andrews. But why have you told me all this? Aren't you afraid I'll report it? <laughs> the police will never believe it. Besides, they could do nothing if they did. No, Doctor, I'm in the clear. I'll start a new life and take up my plans where I left off. That uh, television invention is still waiting to be developed. Uh... Hello, may we come in? 
Doc Marshall said it'd be all right for us to speak to Jeff today. Well, hello, old man. How are you? Judy. Alex. Oh, no. Darling, I'm so glad to be able to see you again at last. No. No. You're not real. You're dead. Mr. Andrews. Send them away. They've no right to come back. I killed them. They're dead. Mr. Andrews, calm yourself, please. I'll take care of them. I'll send them back where they belong. Please, both of you, come outside. They have to go back. They have to stay in their graves. The dead must stay buried. Yes, yes, of course, Jeff. We won't bother you again. Uh, come, Judith. They can't be allowed to disturb me with the dead. I won't stand for it. I tell you, I won't stand for it. I won't stand for it. Oh, Alex, no. he still isn't well. No. We'd never have come, Dr. French, but we thought he was almost well. No. Yes, yeah, so did we. But we were wrong. Just a temporary improvement. He still believes that you were plotting against him and that he killed you for it. But you understand the truth, don't you? I think I do, yes. Well, he overheard us talking about his mental condition and trying to decide what to do about it. And he completely misinterpreted what he heard. And then he... He tried to shoot us and had to be brought here and... Of course, Mrs. Andrews. But I'm afraid we'll never be able to make him believe the truth. Oh, Dante, no. You see, in his mind, he's killed you. As far as he's concerned, you're dead. I'm afraid you must never see him again. He'll live out his life here, believing he has committed a murder for which he cannot be punished. Jeff's idea looked like a good one for a while, didn't it? But I don't advise you to try it. You might wind up the way Jeff did. In fact, my advice is to forget the whole thing. You'll be much happier. There's no such thing as the perfect crime. Which uh, brings me to my story for next week. Death has two faces. It's about a gentleman who discovers a new way to die in which he lets someone else do all the work and he... Oh, you'll have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. Just heard The Mysterious Traveler with a title role played by Maurice Tarplin. Others in our cast were Ralph Bell, Charlotte Holland, Matt Pollan, and Chester Stratton. All characters in our story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Original music composed and played by Al Finelli. Phil Tonkin speaking. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>